Hey everyone, uh, welcome to Grad Chat. This is Chad's first time doing a you know, live Google Hangout to help you guys with your grad school applications. My name is Levi and I run social media here at Chegg. And you know at Chegg we're on a mission to save students money, save you guys time, and help you get smarter. And today we're going to help you out with your grad school applications by giving you insider's tips, some secrets, and best practices when completing your grad school app. So I'm joined today by Marcus Anscombe, who's the Associate Director of Graduate Recruitment at University of New Haven. And hey guys. I'm also joined by Francesca Reed, who's the Director of Graduate Admissions at Marymount University. Hi as well. We're happy to be here, help you navigate the process. Cool. And so we're pretty excited for this. Uh, so we have a few nuggets of information just to pass on to you. You can ask Marcus and Francesca your questions on Twitter using at Chegg and the hashtag GradChat. So you can see that. Just tweet us your questions at Chegg using the hashtag GradChat. And that'll just get us your questions directly and we can answer them live on air. Um, and the Q&A, if you can't make it or can't sit through the whole event, it's going to be recorded and then uploaded to Chegg's YouTube channel right after the chat. So you can go back and rewatch it, share it with your friends, and really just you know get the most out of this chat. So let's go ahead and get started. Sound good, Francesca and Marcus? That sounds great. Yep. Sounds good. Great. So Francesca, the first question is for you from a student at UC Davis. Okay. Who are the best people to ask for recommendation letters? Great. That's a great question. The first thing you would need to do is check with what the program would like you to have. Some programs prefer you have um, only academic type of recommendations. So if that's the case, you're going to need to make sure that if you're currently in school, um, you've already identified professors, faculty that um, you can ask for. Um, and if you've only if you've been out of school for a while, it's going to take a little bit more time to get those academic references. So once you've determined what type of references you need, uh, typically. Um, depending if you need two or three, it's always great to get um, a couple academic references. Um, and the way, the best way to go about doing that is identifying a faculty member, not just someone who knows you in the class, who but knows what your professional interests are. Someone who also you may have done research with, for example, um, who knows more of what more than just the grade you received in the class. Um, so those are important things to look for. Um, also, if you're going the professional route, so either um, a reference from an internship that you've done, um, volunteer work you've done, um, or and the current work that you're doing right now, those are, can be very powerful too. Um, no matter whether you do an academic or a professional um, reference, it's important that you um, bring your resume with, them, with you or send it to them so they have an idea of what your professional goals are and what you've done so far as well. That's really great advice, really great. Um, so we have another question that's coming from student Allie at Vanguard University. And she wants to know if there's anything that, they sh that she should do right after applying and is there anyone, like, who's the number one person to follow up with? And this question is for you, Marcus. Well, certainly here in admissions, um, a lot of schools are set up similarly. I know Fran's office is set up this way as well, that you have an, an admissions counselor or an advisor in the graduate mm -hmm. admissions office that's really your advocate to making sure that any information is given from your application to the advisor or the program committee, depending on how they review, and they can be the primary provider of information for you. It certainly doesn't hurt to reach out to the program advisor at some point in the process, particularly as a prospective student, to get all your questions answered. Uh, in admissions, we do the best we can to answer every question that you have, but certainly the faculty advisor has the most and the best and highest quality and, and will give you the best value in terms of the information that you need and making the right decision. Because we're not here to make you go to you know, my school or make you go to Marymount. We want to make sure that the, the school that you select is the right fit for you and the right fit for your career. Uh, so you want to make sure you get all the information that you need up front. So talk to the advisor. I certainly wouldn't badger the advisor once you do apply. <laughs> um, but definitely, um, 
it helps to talk to the advisor uh, maybe once after you apply just to indicate your interest and talk about your passion for the program because I think your name will stick out in their mind when they come to review your application. They know that you're a passionate individual. Of course, they're going to be looking at your grades and your recommendations and things and, of course, your test scores. Uh, but having somebody that's passionate for what they do, they want to know somebody that's going to add value uh, to the atmosphere, to the program itself, to the uh, ultimately to the field. So they want to they want to have the best student that will fit into their program. So definitely talk to the advisor, but use your admissions counselor to your advantage uh, as long as you have one, of course. Mm -hmm. So the key takeaway is definitely, you know, leverage your connections that you already have with your admissions counselor and your advisor at the school that you've applied to because, you know, they do want to have the best fit for you, whether it's at their school or at another program as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great information. Um, so now we're going to be looking at, back to the rec letters actually, um, what's the best advice, this is a student from uh, Seattle University, mm -hmm. the best advice, uh, Fran, for asking for a rec letter, mm -hmm. is it more so an in-person meeting, should they email the, mm -hmm. the person they're asking, or how should they exactly go about um, you know, getting that initial conversation going when asking for a recommendation letter? Sometimes it can be a little nerve-wracking. Sure, absolutely. Um, I think also depends on your situation. Um, if you're in, if you're still in school, um, or even if you're asking some place where you've internshiped at or your job, sometimes it's it's a courtesy just best to go and ask in person. Um, you know, either if there if it's a faculty member, schedule a meeting, let them know what it's about, um, and meet with them. It's better to meet with them and share what your interests are, where you're applying, what, what you're hoping to do, then trying to jam it all in an email. But it's not to say if, you, if you're unable to set up an appointment one-on-one, uh, -on -one, um, it's fine to send an email. I mean, that's certainly not bad, and that might be your only option, um, especially um, if it's over the summer or whatever the case may be. Uh, but I'll always go back to no matter what you're doing, whether you're meeting in person or you're sending it via email, include your resume, include your professional goals, include where, um, what types of programs you're applying to. Um, if the institution provides you with a form, um, make sure you include that form uh, with them and a return envelope with an address sent directly to the school. Make it as easy for them as possible. Um, that will say that they'll be more willing to do it um, and it will also ensure that um, the recommendation letter um, gets there. There's a lot of institutions now, including our own, that um, the person can actually do the recommendation online. So they will actually get an email from the institution and the person can go online to do it. So if that's an option, you need to let them know. Some people don't feel comfortable doing that and they still want to mail something in. So you got to make sure the institution will accept that. Um, and if they will, then great. You can have the person do it that way as well. Um, another thing I wanted to add that I didn't mention before was try to avoid getting reference letters from uh, family, relatives and families, people you babysat for. Um, we do get those. I know I have a lot of institutions I hear from. Um, sometimes people are just really stretched to finding um, something, but really avoid doing that. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not looked upon highly <laughs> from, from um, institutions. So there you go. So definitely students uh, sticking to the, the professional and the academic Mm -hmm. Recommendations and references are the the way is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And Levi, Levi, I'll just add to that uh, briefly. Um, you always want to talk to the reference before you put their name down. I've yes. I've heard of some students <laughs> that will not talk to them. They just put their name down, and say, "Oh, he'd be great," and then they put them right. down, and it's out of nowhere that they hear about this. Right. Um, the last thing you want to do is anger your reference before they even write their letter. Mm -hmm. And you also want to make sure that you've properly vetted your recommenders because you know it's. Most of us know that so-and-so can give us a great recommendation, and that's right. great. And, you know, you talk to them about it, and they say, we'd love to do it. Just give me your resume, and they'll do it. But mm -hmm. then you might talk to somebody that might say, you know, I might not be the best reference right. for you. I might not be able to give you the best letter that you'll need. And, and, and that's what you want. You want somebody that's going to be honest with you, because the last mm -hmm. thing you want is a mediocre letter at best to go into the admissions office, into your yeah. application, and then that's ultimately what makes or breaks your admission to the program. So yeah. make sure you get the right people and talk to them first and make sure that's going to fit for you. Absolutely. And make sure you give them a deadline <laughs> as well. Um, people get busy too, so it's important to say, I'm really going to need, if they're willing to do it, um, give them a time that you're going to need it by. 
And on that note, what would be a good kind of runway, a, he, a lead way up to your letter deadline? Is you know a month good, two months? You know, a week might be a little tight for turnaround. Okay. So what timeline would you would you give students uh, saying you know get those rec letters in by X date before the before they're due? If time is on your side, <laughs> months is usually um, uh, good. Um, some people don't have that, but at least um, a good six to eight weeks minimum. Um, but if you know you're applying to grad school um, and it's the fall and um, the deadline's coming up in the spring, go ahead and um, start thinking about it and, and getting things ready now. And Marcus, you think that's a good timeline as well, about six to eight weeks? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you want to um, – some faculty, as you know, are, are swamped. I mean, faculty yeah. at most all of our small private institutions especially, are they're, they're already overloaded with classwork and things. Mm -hmm. So to get them to write a letter is difficult, and it's not a bad thing to remind them if it's been three or four weeks. Right. I wouldn't call them every week and nag them because I've had that problem before too mm -hmm. in faculty, and I get asked for them too. And if I'm nagged every week, I'm like, well, just you know, leave me alone for <laughs> Um, or maybe a quick but, letter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's good to be reminded too, because we're all caught mm -hmm. up with our professional commitments. Yeah. That you know, it, sometimes it just slips our mind, and we we mean well, but <laughs> sometimes we have other commitments too. So, so you can kind of tastefully remind, but also you know, if you have time, give them you know six weeks if you can, six to eight weeks, and that's ultimately a good time frame. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're going to kind of switch into looking at the. Um, Kind of like what, how much time and kind of what admissions counselors look or spend their time looking at on the applications. Um, so we have Christina from Humboldt who's asking, are there particular parts of the application that counselors spend more time on than others when they're reviewing? Um, and just kind of like what those parts are and like I know that each program might be a little bit different. But based on, you know, your knowledge of the graduate application program, Marcus, like what would be some of the top um, parts that admissions counselors spend the most time reviewing? Well, first and foremost, grad is very different from undergrad. Um, there are certainly exceptions, but largely on the whole, graduate school decisions, admission decisions are made by faculty. So they aren't made by folks in our offices. Like, uh, you know, I'll have applications come in and I'll process those applications, but I'm not making a decision on a file. I'm passing that off to a program committee or an advisor will be making that admission decision. So um, ultimately it's in their hands and of course it is program specific. Test scores and transcripts are generally tend to be the highest piece of your application. Uh, in our case I'd say that accounts for at least 80 to 90 percent, the com combination of the two or the admission decision. Um, though the letters of recommendation would be clearly the next piece of that. Some programs like for instance doctoral programs are going to look heavily on writing statements also so that's mm -hmm. going to be a piece that you want to make sure that you spend extra time on um, making sure that it's right and, and that you're you know you can get it checked it doesn't hurt to get some grammar yes. checks and things those are very important you know I, I know some schools they see one grammar mistake and they'll automatically cast you aside you don't want to be thrown aside just because you made one oversight um, and don't trust Microsoft Word to <laughs> trust a person <laughs> to do your grammar checks for you um, but you know the writing sample is important but you know if you have a GMAT or GRE that's required for your program you definitely want to take the time to study and make sure you get a decent score. Some schools have incentives, um, like application uh, uh, waiver incentives, or they might mm -hmm. pay you back for the test if you score a certain way, or there are scholarships in some cases. So definitely be aware of um, the weight, and of course it'll be different for every school, but the weight of the test score. If it's a, if it's a score that's kind of recommended but not required, don't blow it off, but then again, you don't have to spend all kinds of inordinate months of time trying to make mm -hmm. sure you score a perfect score on the thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but your transcripts are certainly going to be valuable, of course, and um, so those are the ultimately the, the biggest pieces, at least for us, and I don't know if Fran has any differences on her campus. Yeah, I would agree with what Marcus has to say, and, you know, in addition to the personal statement or, or essay that you have to write, um, there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet um, that gives suggestions or, um, things that you can write. Um, we've seen stuff that looks similar, so really make sure it's your own words. Um, I mean, as much as information is out there, um, it's, it's fine to, to look it over and get some ideas, but really make it your own words. Uh, we've seen multiple copies of stuff before, and it's unfortunate for students. They really can, can blow it by doing that. Um, and if your program does require an interview, um, we have several of our programs require that really, if you get to the interview stage, 
treat it like you're going for a job interview. You really, really need to um, do your homework. Do your homework about the program, um, it, you know, about the faculty, whatever you can find that's out there, and come prepared um, and, and really know the profession that you're considering. Um, that's the thing about graduate school, like Marcus said, unlike undergrad, uh, you're you're going for a particular career for the most part. So know know what you want to do. Awesome. So that's uh, kind of to recap some of the, the main points that you made there. Befriend an English major to have them overlook <laughs> your, your writing samples. Make sure it's your own work. No plagiarism there. I mean, it's the same as undergrad. You know, you don't want to yeah. be caught giving off someone else's words and trying to pass them off as your own. Mm -hmm. um, study for your required tests ahead of time. Practice your interviews. Treat it like a job interview. You're going for an internship. Mm -hmm. And definitely do your research and homework in the career field, the industry and just kind of about the school in general, just so you can knock that interview out of the ballpark as if you would if it's a, um, uh, a job interview. Great. Great. Um, and just kind of coming from on the application itself, um, if you do have insight you know, into reviewing the applications, uh, Francesca, mm -hmm. what are kind of the most common application mistakes that people make? I mean, I know that there are some, some oversights that you mentioned, Marcus, around the um, you know, a grammar mistake, but yep. what's kind of the most common big application mistakes that students may make? Um, well, in addition to the whole grammar, which is definitely um, common, um, some other ones, maybe not necessarily as common, but um, your personal statement doesn't match up with the program that you actually apply to. <laughs> um, we've seen those. Um, People not, if you know, it's your, look for little details. Um, there's a reason there's an application, and I'm just talking the basic stuff. Sign it, if, if you need a signature, you need to sign it. Um, those types of things. We, we don't like to have to go back to people and say, oh, you forgot to do this section, or you didn't sign it, and things like that. So th those are very basic kind of things. I think people get really nervous about applying, and they just kind of forget those basic steps. Um, you know, the other things, uh, would be just making sure you've met, you follow whatever deadlines that are in place. Uh, a lot of times students will submit stuff after the deadline and um, have not done their homework regarding that. Um, make sure that going back to the recommenders that the right recommendation goes with the right application. Um, sometimes we get recommendations for other institutions um, that they were supposed to go to and it's really unfortunate. You feel really bad. Um, so you just don't want those types of mistakes mistakes um, happening as well. So I'm sure Marcus has additional stuff he can add. Well, I think if, if we could sum it up in one sentence, it's, we <laughs> want you to be, you got to be detail oriented. Um, yeah. That's really what it comes down to because as Fran said, you know, we get other institutions listed in, in personal statements and, and uh, on letters of recommendation and, and all kinds of things. And some schools even, they'll ask, they'll have you address certain issues within mm -hmm. your personal statement. They might say, tell us why you'll add value to the field, or tell us why you're committed to such and such a subject, or make sure you're addressing whatever they ask. They, we make sure, I know all of us as grad schools, and Fran and I are very professionally involved, and there's a lot of discussion about best practices and what we do, and we make sure that up front we publicize very specifically mm -hmm. what our students have to do to get admitted to the program. And mm -hmm. so it's very clear for you, and if you ever have questions, that's what we're here for. Pick mm -hmm. up the phone and ask the question. Talk to your advisor. Don't just try to hope that you've got it figured out and you send it in and then one little mistake throws you off. So that detail orientation is extremely important, and that's what faculty are looking for, too. They mm -hmm. want a student that's going to be detail-oriented, that can do the work, that's going to be productive, particularly in certain majors like psychology. Psychology, for instance, yeah. you've got to be detail oriented. A statistics guy's got to be, you know, <laughs> got to be detail oriented. So those types of things are very important. And should and avoid slang. <laughs> avoid <laughs> yes. slang. I think people get so comfortable with tweeting and stuff like that, they tend to incorporate it in emails and sometimes in personal statements. Don't do that. Go back to the basics. <laughs> yes. Good to know. Um, and should a student discover that? They made some type of mistake that they forgot something on their application that they realized, you know, they accidentally did in fact send, you know, Marymount um, University of New Haven's uh, personal statement. What are the steps that that student should take to kind of correct that mistake that they've made, just so that they better their chances of still being admitted to, you know, the school of their of their choice? Um. 
I can address that. Um, it depends. I think that um, every institution is going to treat it differently. Um, some may not let the applicant know that they received um, inappropriate documents or um, something didn't match up. Um, but a lot of places will. And um, if it's a case of you sent the wrong personal statement, um, you know, the best you can do is just uh, apologize for that and immediately get them the right statement. Uh, you know, a lot of times, um, after they put the packet together, it may not even have been noticed. You know, they'll, they'll get rid of the old statement and put the new one in. It really is going to depend on the institution, the number of applications, and so forth. I wouldn't, um, you know, if a mistake is made and um, you've been alerted to it, just be as professional as you can, quickly um, correct the mistake, and try not to linger on it too much. You know, um, if, if it's a program getting a lot of applications, they may soon forget about it. <laughs> right. um, but, you know, if it's a doctoral program and they're only accepting 10, you know, students, um, that might be a little bit more challenging. You know, it really mm -hmm. is. So you just have to do the best you can, um, correct the, the problem if you, if you get a chance to, and, and go forward. Surely use your um, admissions counselor to your advantage. <laughs> we, we can really be advocates, um, at least in my experience, talking to admissions counselors you know, across the country. And I know it's particularly true of our offices. You know, we, we really act on behalf of the student. You're our number one priority. We want to make sure you're fit. We want to make sure you're comfortable. We want to make sure that you're getting the best program and the best fit for you right mm -hmm. off the bat. So uh, we're here to serve you. And in absence of the fact that we can't make that decision on your file, we're certainly willing to come to bat for you mm -hmm. if you show that you know there's commitment to you making sure your file is right and you you know committed to the school and you're really passionate about what you're doing. We're happy to help where we can, and especially if you catch it before a decision's been made. And even if we've sent oh, yeah. the file to a faculty member, I'm happy to pick up the phone and go to bat for a student if something mm -hmm. came in. And, and generally, that's worked out very favorably for us. So definitely use your admissions counselor to your advantage. That's great. So it sounds like, you know, to definitely just review your application after you submit and go through like line by line and just make sure that there aren't any mistakes, even after you've already, you know, reviewed it twice, checked it, just make sure that you have dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. And if you do catch a mistake, um, you know, reach out to your admissions counselor. And that's, that's yeah, that's solid. Great advice. Great advice. Um, so Moving into the, um, actually looking at application deadlines, I actually have a question that just came in. Um, if you're running late to turn in an application, I mean, I know that deadlines are pretty important, and that's why they're posted publicly um, months in advance before, you know, it's actually due. But some students, you know, they do happen to procrastinate at times, and so should you be running late by a day or two to turn in your application, what is the best course of action to take on that? Well, to sound like a broken record, call your admissions counselor. <laughs> we, uh, you know, we have a uh, with the two programs that we have had, we have really strict deadlines for mm -hmm. our education and forensic science. And yeah. um, when we've had, it depends on the year. Some years we have we've been more fluid about the deadline because you know we might have a few seats left and we can still review for another week. So we're happy to do that, but you won't ever know that unless you call your admissions counselor. So, so don't ever go like, oh, the deadline's over, I can't do it anymore. Call your admissions counselor, ask them what the situation is, if they think they might be able to get it in for review. And, you know, worst thing is they say, you know, we're full. But try it anyway, and generally that's the best way to do it because the admissions counselor will be talking regularly with the faculty, particularly for those deadline programs because we have to be on top of those all the time. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I would agree with what Marcus has to say. Not, and sometimes you might have a few days of wiggle room anyway, um, because materials, even if students have already submitted their application, um, we know that mail sometimes can linger. Um, so you have a few days. Um, not to say that you should wait to the last minute, but um, it is. I think you just reach out to the institution and get your materials in. It doesn't hurt to ask them. Good to know. Um, do you have a question on coming from Facebook? That's um, regarding uh, transferring from a student who's transferred from a community college and they're actually wondering if they're applying to a grad school, will the grades from that community college be looked at for grad school or will only the, um, the ones from their four year be looked at and whether or not that's different for individual schools. Just kind of like what have you seen around um, students who start off at a community college and then move over towards to a four-year and then apply to grad school. How is that typically handled? 
Go ahead, you Marcus. Go. What's that? Oh, okay. <laughs> either way, either way. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say that we require, and I know a lot of institutions require all transcripts. So whatever college coursework you've done, we're going to require the transcripts. Um, some people assume that if they went to a community college, for example, or another institution and they transferred and graduated somewhere else, that all those grades and coursework will be showed on their final transcript. That's not always the case because not everything transfers, and sometimes and the grades necessarily won't be listed. So we do require, um, for the most part, a lot of institu institutions do all of your all of your transcripts. And we will recu recalculate your GPA <laughs> if yes. we need to do that. <laughs> so, it's not uncommon today to have people doing community colleges and then going to a four-year mm -hmm. program, particularly with the economy the way it is. There's a lot of students choosing that route, so there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Um, there are students that unfortunately I've talked to that get, they go, oh, I goofed off for two years and then I got serious. And unfortunately, that's impacted them in the long run. So. Um, Certainly do the best you can your junior and senior years. Uh, if you have time to kind of reverse that, definitely pay attention to that because we will look at all four years and your cumulative mm -hmm. GPA. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, in some cases, depending on the program, you could take some courses over, for instance, or take some additional courses to kind of level out your GPA, maybe in a subject area like in mm -hmm. business, if you needed to take a stats course or something. Mm -hmm. And you could work that out generally with the advisor of the prospective program. So, but definitely do your research, make sure you're up on that. Uh, yep. beforehand and use your admissions counselor to your advantage but also work with the advisor and, and see how they can uh, best make sure it works for you because we oftentimes have students for instance for forensic science that want our criminalistics program which is a lab really a lab heavy degree and they don't come in with enough sciences so we'll allow them to take maybe a semester or two worth of science lab courses even at a community college level because we don't want to force them to go pay a university tuition mm -hmm. to do that Mm -hmm. And then uh, we'll work with them and advise them on the best courses to do that. And then we'll make sure that they fit into the prerequisites. And they might not be transferring into your undergrad because you're already done, but there's something that you could be using toward at least prerequisites to get into your grad program. Absolutely. So it sounds like regardless of whether you choose a two-year path to a four-year and whether that's public or private, your grades matter. And it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know, how they transferred across, you know, it, the people reviewing your application are going to look at your GPA, so take your college here seriously if you're considering uh, grad school, and if you're a junior now still considering grad school, uh, you know, do what you can to, to really keep your GPA up as you enter your last couple of semesters of undergrad. Mm -hmm. Sure. Cool. Um, let's see, where are we now with questions? Looking into when you're admitted to schools, um, so Marcus, if, in, in Fran actually, um, best case scenario for any student is that they get into all the schools they apply to and now they're coming down to actually making that admissions decision. Should a student get into uh, more than one school, kind of from a personal standpoint, what are your recommendations and kind of uh, best practices around deciding on which school to uh, actually pursue? Well, there's a lot of factors for sure. Um, <laughs> And, you know, from our side, we just want to know what you're doing. Um, so that's really important to us because particularly for graduate programs, most of them have a certain number of seats that we can admit a year. So we need students to let us know if they want to take one of those seats. Otherwise, we'll free it up for someone else. So, um, so you definitely need to let schools know as soon as you know. But as far as the decision-making process, there's so many factors. I mean, you might have family commitments. Um, Maybe distance from home is important to you if you're going to have to relocate. You know, we have about half of our students that actually move up here. So that's a, that's a big time commitment. It's a big financial commitment. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, especially if you went to school close to home for your undergrad. You might not be used to going far away. So you have to think about the distance to home. You have to think about your comfort in terms of maybe an urban environment versus a suburban environment. Um, think about the program fit for you. Uh, maybe, you know, we have a lot of school students that come in here. They say they want to be in a lecture hall. They'd rather be a number. Um, and our campus is you're more of a name and a face. They want to be in a small class size where they're talking to people and they know everybody. Mm -hmm. So if we have people that want a lecture hall, hall style class, we say, you know, go somewhere else. There's, this isn't going to work for you. So sometimes class size might be a factor that's there. Um, certainly financials are a factor. You might have scholarship opportunities or an assistantship at some schools. Um, so there's certainly a lot to look at. Um, but think about ultimately what your career goal is. It's very important for you now. At the, undergrad, at the end of undergraduate, you generally, and most of us, don't know what we're going to be when we grow up, even after undergrad now. So when you're looking at grad school, you're 
you're planning on a program of something that you want. You know, you want to be a forensic scientist. You want to be a statistician. You want to be an engineer. So you're going into a graduate program that's in one of those industries. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you're going to something that's committed to your passion, that wants to make sure that you're successful as much as you want to be successful, and they're willing to give you the opportunities to make sure that you get there, and that ultimately maybe the job outcomes are there on the outside, um, on the other side. And some of that's easier to find out than others, but I'd encourage you to talk to current students if you can, or talk to alums. Find out what people are doing. Find out about the success stories, what kind of jobs people are getting. Those are all important things for you to do, and especially after you've been admitted, now you know, okay, I can get in there, and I know I've got a seat if I want it. Now let me just talk to some students. Maybe even go shadow a class. You can sit in a class at most, most places. We'll accommodate you to do that. Um, or come and you know, sleep over in town and just see what the city's like, you know, that kind of stuff. So get a feel for it and then decide if that's something that feels comfortable for you. Because ultimately, we're not, not all of us are very good at trusting our gut. But when you get on a college campus, when you sit in a class, when you talk to a faculty member, when you talk to students in the program, you'll have a gut feeling if that's somewhere you belong. And that's really important in deciding the process. Yeah. I was going to add, if you've had the opportunity prior to being accepted, visit the institutions you're applying to, because then that's going to save you a lot of the time that if you are accepted to multiple schools, you've already kind of narrowed it down, um, and you, you kind of know what, what you like and what you don't like, um, because there are lots of times where students do kind of apply blindly. They like the program from what they've seen online or they've heard, but they've never actually been to the campus, or they had no idea really what it was near or how much it costs to live in the area and things like that. And so. Um, Students tend to scramble um, once they have a deposit deadline and they want one extent extensions and so forth. So it's important to try to get that stuff as much as you can out of the way. And then I think the suggestions Mark has had about, you know, if you have a chance to talk to a current student or alum, um, there's no harm in asking your admissions counselor um, for, for a name, for an email, for something like that. Most of the time, they'll be more than happy to give that to you. Uh, and that might help you make that final decision if you're choosing among several schools. And that's actually a question that another student asked um, is looking at that networking type, those networking type of opportunities with mm -hmm. either current students or alumni. Um, like, what kind of advice would you give to a student who is looking to network? I know that you have, you know, reach out to your admissions counselor um, is definitely a, a good suggestion. But from your experience, are there any, you know, like networking groups that are local or? type of uh, websites or anything like that that connects alumni to prospective students and just kind of like brings them together and just kind of like what kind of uh, advice would you give to a student looking to do that? Well, for one, social media is, a, is mm -hmm. the easiest way for most people. Um, for us, LinkedIn has been the best way to connect with current students and alumni. Um, Facebook's great to tech connect with connect with current students, but we have less alums that are involved on the Facebook page side. But if you go on LinkedIn, we've got a, you can see what people are doing. You know, find out what kind of jobs they have. Um, but we also have some of our programs have their own groups on there. So like our IO Psychology program has a group that's closed just to students that have been admitted and our current students or alumni of that program. So they have a network, and many of them have been communicating on there for years. That's their primary way of keeping in contact. So you could ask some questions of, of the alumni on there, talk to faculty, talk to current students, because they're all connected that way. That's really a fantastic resource. Of course, professional conferences are great, too. I mean, our, for instance, our, our forensic science students and our faculty were just down at the uh, American Association of Forensic Sciences Conference, which was in D.C., so right in Fran's neck of the woods. And um, that's, they offer a lot of networking sessions there. They have, a, they have a graduate fair now, so they actually had opportunities to talk to schools. And then many schools will have their own alumni networking receptions, and they'll invite students to join them. So if you have those opportunities, look into that. That's definitely a chance to do that. And there's a lot of professional associations. Uh, SHRM's a great one uh, for human resource management and IO psychology. And just getting your kind of word out there, a lot of universities really network within those organizations because they know that they're able to provide the industry uh, with new professionals that will be going in and they want to make sure they're preparing their students right but also connecting all their students for jobs. So that's really a good opportunity for you there. Absolutely. Yeah, I think everything Marcus said was right, spot on. Um, and then once I think you, you um, start the programs, a lot of these associations um, have the student side of it. So be a part of it, get involved, um, and then those, those relationships you're building through that will continue on once you're looking for a job in the field. So. 
And then looking at jobs, um, you know, that's a huge part of why students go to grad school so that they can actually get the jobs that they want and launch the careers that they want to, you know, after they are come done with their degree. Um, I'm sure that there are multiple paths that a person might be able to take to uh, get to the job that they like. I mean, we just did a, a blog post around some executives at large companies who may not have the traditional majors that um, would be associated with you know, a CEO of a company. And so in looking at those types of career paths, what additional resources do you, have you seen for students who are trying to map how their education aligns with their career choice and their career path? Um, a lot of um, programs have internships that are built in. So that, of course, is a real easy way to, to start that networking, start that relationship building. Um, with several of our programs, a lot of students have actually gotten jobs, their first job um, in in the field through those internship opportunities. So if your program has that built in incorporated, definitely um, that's a sure way um, at least to get your foot in the door. Um, career services on campuses, although many are geared towards undergraduate students, um, go to them because um, when they invite recruiters on campus, Lots of times um, they want a seasoned person. Me seasoned mean they may have work experience in other fields, and now that they have a graduate degree, they might be um, more likely to hire you over an undergraduate student, for example. So don't discount your career services center. Um, you know, go to them, see what kind of opportunities are available, see if there's recruitment events on campus, those types of things. So definitely take um, advantage of that. And your faculty, the one great thing about being a graduate student is your faculty, those connections you're going to make with your faculty. Um, a lot of them are working in the industry, um, and they have the, the relationships that you want. Um, so use, uh, you know, go to them, ask them. Um, they invite special speakers to class. Make sure you ask questions, get business cards. Those are great opportunities. And use your classmates. Some of them are were already working in the field um, and they may be a great resource for you. We have in our HR program students that are working in HR and those that are trying to get into HR. Several of them have gotten jobs just because of their classmates. So um, those are great um, professional networks that you that you can have to get you to where you need to go. Definitely the people in the field are the best um, the best resource for you. So I always encourage students and it sounds silly but if you know somebody that's in a position that you want, why not pick up the phone? Why not call them and find out, you know, say, can I come in and meet with you for five minutes? Can I, can I eat lunch with you one day and just kind of pick your brain about what you're looking for in your employees or what degree did you have? You know, just ask them, shoot them an email to say, what degree did you need to get into this job? Um, all those types of things. It doesn't hurt to ask that. And most people are more than willing to provide that kind of information. So definitely try to find out what people are doing. Even go on a LinkedIn and type in a job title or Google a job title that you want, your dream job. Many LinkedIn profiles at least have education as a public viewable um, piece. So mm -hmm. you can go in and see what degrees people have and just compare them and see across the way, okay, you know, if I get an Iowa psychology degree, this is what it's going to do for me. If I do forensic science, this is what I'm going to do. And, uh, and then, of course, tap into the alumni networks if those are available on the prospective student side before you're coming in as a student and you're enrolled, do you have an opportunity to talk to those alumni? And I know we talked about some of those options, but that's a good way to find out. Or even ask the programs. Ask your program advisor before you even apply if you want to. Ask them, what kind of job can I expect once I graduate here? And of course, your expectations are extremely important. I, I know a lot of students that come in here and they expect to be a CEO the minute they walk out with their own <laughs> It would be nice if we could give you a six-figure salary as soon as you graduate. That's going to make your student loans disappear a lot faster. Uh, but we want to make sure that you have reasonable expectations. So that's a good question to ask of your advisors before you even apply. Say, what kind of job can I expect? What kind of salary can I expect? And then what's the ladder look like? What does it take to grow to this dream position that I want? And then can I talk to any of your alumni or current students that have been successful in the field and ask how the degree prepared them for that job or ask what other things I should do in addition to just getting the degree. Should I be involved in the SHRM organization on campus? Should I be doing an internship or should I be doing research instead because that's more important for my career path? So ask those questions. People are very readily available and willing to help you with those. Perfect. That's, uh, that's great. It's really good. Um, just got a question coming in looking at just kind of wondering about the um, admissions process and comparing that to undergrad. 
-hmm. So student at UCLA is asking, you know, when they applied there, um, they were applying to the undergrad through a, like an early decision, early action type of program. Are there any similar type of programs for grad school the where a student can either find out early ahead of time, maybe kind of beat the, the mass of applicants that are applications that are filtering in just to show that school they're more committed um, to going there? Go ahead, Marcus. <laughs> I'm not personally <laughs> um, I'm not personally aware of any that are yeah. that, we, that we call early action or early decision at the grad yeah. school level. But I'll give you an example for instance our forensic science program, our deadline is tomorrow. So um, students that apply right this very minute, there's already been seats that have been selected for the program. So we've already booked up some of those spots, for lack of a better term. Um, and there's also kind of this, uh, particularly with the more selective program, the, our criminalistics program only takes 12 students a year. Mm -hmm. So those students are expected to be applying November, at December at the latest in most cases. Of course, students still apply in January, February. Mm -hmm. But with the deadline of tomorrow, the program committee in that, program they review maybe two to three times a committee over the course of the winter time so they do an early review in January so we actually do provide decisions in mid-January so so you're well ahead of the curve for, for most students whereas these students that are applying now they're gonna wait two or three weeks and they're in the bottom of the last part of the pile with less seats available so by applying earlier even though it's not a called an early decision or early action in often cases, you'll be given a decision earlier on as well, and that'll help you in your decision-making process and helps you secure that earlier seat over other students. So, Fran, I don't know about your experience, but that's Yeah, that's about right. Um, I, I think the closest thing to what that person might be um, inquiring about is there's some programs, we have them too, that have priority deadlines. Um, they may have a priority deadline and then a final deadline. Um, so similar to what Marcus is saying, for those that kind of meet that priority deadline, you're essentially going to be reviewed before anyone else, and they're going to accept a certain number in the, during that process. And then anyone else is coming for that second deadline, well, you're kind of left with what still potentially could be available. Um, so, of course, the earlier you can get your things in, um, the better. Uh, every program is different. Um, our forensic psychology program, they review them all at once. So um, it's good to have all your stuff in early, uh, but it's not necessarily going to change your fate, um, per se, um, once the faculty committee starts reviewing that. But other programs are reviewing them as they come in until the um, final deadline. So that's another question you can ask, too when you're applying is, you know, are decisions made prior to the deadline or decisions only made after the deadline as well to kind of give you a sense of what you can expect. Great to know. That's a uh, really good advice. So definitely, you know, if you're interested in the program, it sounds like applying early is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so I think that we're actually wrapping up with questions. Um, so Marcus and Fran, um, let's get you to give you know, your last bit of advice to uh, the students who are looking to apply and just any last minute type of tips that you would, you know, are looking to give them. Anything I think would really be appreciated on, on their part. Sure. Brandon, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my um, words of wisdom would be um, really take the time to do your homework. I think that, um, I think with this current uh, economy and stuff, there's a lot of undergraduates who are saying, you know what, I'm just going to go to grad school right now and worry about getting a job later. Grad school is a huge investment. Your undergrad was already a huge investment. Grad school is even bigger, and it's really very career specific. So make sure it's something that you want to do. Um, all of the stuff that we suggested today, talking to professionals in the field, um, talking with faculty, those types of things, those are all important to do um, prior to deciding what kind of career path you want to go into. See if it's going to be a good fit. Um, if you're not quite sure, take a class a, a, as a non-degree student. If you're not sure you want to be an educator, you know, a teacher, for example, sit in, in a classroom and see what that's going to be about, or a business major, whatever the case may be. If the school allow you to do it, there's no harm necessarily in doing that if you can financially do that. Um, all the stuff we pointed to today, uh, you know, be professional, look for deadlines, make sure you dot your I's, cross your T's, all those types of things. Um, utilize the admissions counselor, as Marcus has said. Um, they really are there for your advocate, as your advocate. Um, 
and visit the campus, uh, make an appointment, do all those things. It's going to make it a lot easier and less stressful for you. Uh, and, um, and really just kind of, you know, in, enjoying the time might not be the right word, but um, this really is, for a lot of people, it's it's what they want to do. It, they want to be a counselor. They, they want to be a forensic psychologist, whatever the case may be. So it's really exciting. They're going to get to do coursework they really want to do. Um, and so, you know, just take your time and make sure um, you're going on the right path. Okay. Great advice. Um, you know, I'll add just a couple of things. One thing we had talked about, um, or we hadn't talked about much, at least mm -hmm. today, was much about financial aid. And I just wanted to mention briefly a little bit about the financials because it's a big investment, as, as we've talked about several times uh, in this conversation. And I want to make sure that you're aware of the financial opportunities that are available for you at each graduate school. And it does vary. So make sure you're asking that question early on in the process so that you have all the information that you need to make the decision that you have. Um, you know, some students have inordinate amounts of undergraduate student debt, so adding huge amounts of graduate debt is not an option for them. Uh, whereas some students had a lot of scholarships in undergrad and going to a great graduate school and paying, paying full freight is okay for them. So it depends on what your scenario is, but make sure that you're aware of those options and aware of your financial constraints. Um, many graduate schools, we're not like undergrad where we have this plethora of grants and work study and scholarships and all this money to throw around. Um, if, if there are certainly assistantships at many schools where you're even getting half tuition or full tuition in many cases. Particularly doctoral students will get funded for doing teaching assignments on campus. So just take a look into those options. Um, you know, for instance, like uh, Fran and I work at private institutions, so private institutions are generally more expensive than a lot of the public universities. So we, from a financial standpoint, on a sticker price, we certainly look like a more difficult value than some of the public institutions. But you also may look at the fact that we have assistantships or scholarships and things to offer that offset those costs and make it very affordable. Most students at the graduate level will use the Stafford loans. Um, and just be aware that recently, you may be aware that the Congress has changed the rules on the Stafford Loan C will accrue interest once you start school. Um, so it is something to be aware of. But uh, students generally get about 20500 per year uh, that they can use toward their studies. And if you don't have to use them toward your studies, for instance, an assistantship might be paying half tuition for you, mm -hmm. that additional money, so say $10,000 for instance, can be used for your living expenses. So you don't have to think, oh, I can't make this happen for tuition. And then you get an assistantship, but you're like, oh, I don't know what to do with this $10,000. Well, if you're relocating, <laughs> I can pay for my apartment that way, you can pay for your car, pay for your books. So there are a lot of ways to make it very affordable for you. So definitely look into those options, ask those questions. That's what we're here for. Um, you know, as broken record, use your admissions counselor. Um, but it's a very important for you to know your priorities too. You know, largely a lot of the students on here, I would assume, are undergraduate students right now. We have students that are working professionals, that have families. We have people that, um, that they want to get done as quickly as possible, or they can only go to class one day a week. Um, so you have to think about, for you, what, what's most important? Is schedule most important to you? Do you only want to go to class a couple days a week? Do you want to go to just day classes? Do you want to go to just night classes? Like, for instance, almost all of our classes are night classes here. Um, so that allows students to work during the day, so there's different um, options that way. Um, some students want to go fully online. We didn't talk a lot about online op options today, but there's certainly a huge growth in online programs. So think about that being an option. Some schools offer hybrid programs where you're going a couple days a week to class, and then you might have a week or two online, and then you go back to class, and then you're connecting that way. So think about course delivery. Think about the location. Do you want to go somewhere else? Do you want to go somewhere exotic like New Haven, Connecticut? Or do you want to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're nice this time of year. Um, <laughs> you can, uh, you know, decide if, if, if certainly the program sizes we talked about, the size of campus. Like for me, if I had the option, I did both of my degrees here at the University of New Haven, small private institution. But if I had, if I had the money and the means to go, and I wasn't working full time, and I didn't get into a great job and work into what I'm doing now. I would have liked to go to like a Big Ten school and get into the big athletic environment and go to a D1 school and we're on TV and the whole, like that's, for me, I really wanted that experience. So that's something to think about too. Think about the experience you've had with undergrad. You know, we often have a lot of students that come from those big schools in undergrad because right. they mm -hmm. want to go to a small school. Mm -hmm. So then they get the more personalized environment at the graduate level. So think about all those things, what your priorities are, and then determine which schools fit into those priorities. And you'll find there are so many options out there so many different, you know, alternate ways, you know, things done at 
at Marymount are very similar to us in some ways, but totally different than others. Mm -hmm. So make sure you ask the questions, learn about those characteristics, and find out, do they want me there, for one? And two, am I going to want to be there? Is that going to make me, because this is a big investment in your career and the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. This isn't like, oh, we're just going to float around, give you a degree, and then you're going to go figure something else out. This is really the rest of your life. So you want to make sure you make the best decision, ask the right questions, and befriend all the people on campus you can to get the decisions made the right way for you. Very solid advice from both Fran and Marcus, so thank you guys uh, for that. So we did have one question actually that came in kind of last minute, which is kind of that question that is always there in the back of every student who's applying for something's mind, but they don't really want to think about it too much because, you know, you do want to stay on the positive side of thinking. But in the event that a student is denied to their dream schools, um, what should they do as a follow-up, as looking in the future for applying again, just kind of what steps should they take if they don't get into their uh, the school of their choice? Yeah, um, it's. I think it's going to vary. There's no harm in asking. Um, sometimes the you might get a response back from the institution um, with some generic kind of information about. In test scores and things like that and how you can improve your application status. But a lot of times programs are not going to give you the particulars. They don't have to necessarily give you the particulars of why you were not accepted. Um, some basic stuff you can initially do is if you know kind of what the minimum GPA is, what, if they're if their standardized test, test scores or looking at things like that, you know, see if you even met the minimums. Um, and um, that might be an indicator right there. Maybe it's purely they have only have so many spots, they've received hundreds of applications, and those are the things they have to go by. Um, so take a look at that. Um, take a look at some programs require that you at least have some volunteer experience or something in the field, like counseling, for example. If you hadn't had those opportunities, go out and get them. Um, that might be a way um, that you can differentiate your differentiate yourself from another applicant. Um, take a non-degree class. Um, prove that you can do the graduate work. Um, if they allow you to do that, there's no harm in doing it. Um, I don't necessarily discourage applicants if they were denied, if they want to reapply the following year. Uh, we certainly have programs like physical therapy is a perfect example. You have 800 applications for 35 spots. Um, you're going to have some really qualified students that are not going to get in. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, um, but um, you just you have to see what's going to differentiate yourself next time around. So if you do decide to reapply, your application, though, is going to have to be a little different. And when I say different, meaning you have to show that you've improved in whatever it is. So if it was a, if it was a standardized test score and you retook the GREs, did you do better this time around? You know, um, freshen up your personal statement. Um, throw in that volunteer experience, whatever the case may be. Don't resubmit the same thing you did the year before. Um, so those are all types of things you need to, to look at. So. And you want to remember that admissions in most cases is not make, <laughs> making the decision. I get a lot of phone calls, Marcus, why didn't you let me into the program? Uh, <laughs> We're buddies. <laughs> So, you know, we do the best we can for you mm -hmm. to come to bat, but ultimately we're not the ones who make the decisions. Right. And you'll also find that many institutions have policies in how decisions can be related to students. And oftentimes mm -hmm. that means admissions, people like me, can't tell you what we know if we know anything. And, and oftentimes we don't know um, mm -hmm. the reasons why an admission decision happened the way it did. So talk to your advisor and the faculty if you can. Some will talk to you, especially at the smaller schools. They have the advantage of a smaller student population that we can spend time talking to you. And ask the question. It doesn't hurt. As Fran was talking about, ask them, what will strengthen my application? Maybe it's something clear, like your GPA was just too low, so you know what to do about that. But maybe it's something like, you know, it would be great if you got, and maybe you've applied early enough that you're still an undergrad, that you can get involved with something, get involved with a professional association, or do an internship, or do some research, or take a prerequisite at a community college, whatever those things are. And be sure that your program will, will take another application from you. Maybe it's a one and done kind of thing, but make sure you ask the program, because that varies from school to school too. And you might have a limitation on how many times you can apply. They might say, well, only look at your application two times or three times. And after that, unfortunately, you'll have to move on. So make sure you ask all those questions of the advisor. And, and oftentimes, the advisor will be at least giving you options and, and suggestions on what you can do to strengthen your application. Mm -hmm. Great to know. That's really, really solid advice. Um, so thank you, Fran. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for jumping on this. And I know that you've helped a lot of students out 
as they are going through the graduate application process, often for the first time with little guidance from some other resources. So um, thank you both for joining us um, on this grad chat. Sure. And students, again, um, if you didn't get your question asked and you do have more, uh, feel free to tweet them. Again, at Chag using the hashtag gradchat, and we'll route them towards Fran and Marcus and try and get you some answers on those. And again, this video has been recorded and will be on our YouTube channel uh, for you to watch and come back to and pull out what nuggets of information that you would like to pull from it uh, later. So feel free to check that out on Chag's YouTube channel. So thank you, Fran. Thank you, Marcus. And good luck, students, with your applications. And best of luck as they're due. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Best of luck. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.